Will you pray with me? O oh, holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we are moving through this season of Lent, the season that starts on Ash Wednesday and takes us through until Easter morning with a series focused on the stories of our faith. And we're looking at the covenant that we make as a community. Uh, it's typically considered the covenant when you join and become an official member of the church. Uh, but I would suggest to you that this is a covenant that describes how we expect to be together, whether you officially join or not. Uh, and so there's five parts to that covenant. Uh, we lift up that we covenant with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And we say that we will bring those things to bear on the community for the sake of the gospel, uh, and that is what makes us who we are. So that is the covenant that we make together. Now, I, I want to play with the covenant just a little bit this morning, because when we look at it, it's, it's kind of like, okay, prayers, that, that's on me. I can pray or I can pray with the church. Present me, presence means I'm going to show up. Gifts means you want my money. I mean, that's how we look at it, right? Gifts means you want my money. Service means I'm going to do something for somebody else and be involved in something that helps somebody else. And then witness uh, is one of those late additions that we're still not real sure what to do with because it sounds like you want me out inviting people into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I'm just not sure about that. And so we have this odd... And so when we look at it on the surface... We're not real sure what to do with some of these parts of our covenant. Um, and today I do want to focus on gifts. I'd like to, uh, to remind you that when I talk about your gifts, I am not specifically talking about your wallet. I am talking about your wallet in part, uh, but not in total. And that's kind of where we are with this odd thank you note that Paul writes to the church at Philippi. This is probably the worst thank you note that any of us have ever heard. I don't know, maybe you've received a thank you note that was worse. Thank you for the gift, I can't stand it. I don't know, was it, have you received a thank you note like that? But Paul writes this note and he's like, you know, I'm so glad you finally thought about me. I mean, that's what it sounds like to me. I, I, I rejoice in the Lord that now at last, you have revived your concern for me. So it's like, I'm so glad you finally remembered me. You know, oh, okay, no guilt there. Um, and then he goes on, oh, but no, you were concerned. You just didn't have a chance to tell me. I, 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 it's okay. I didn't really mean it quite like that. And, uh, and, he goes, and then he goes on to say, not that I really needed what you gave me. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, I know what it is to, I can be content with, little. I can be content with a lot. I didn't really need, you know, it's like, seriously, this is a thank you note. You didn't need what I gave you. Save your stamps. You know, I'd almost rather not hear from you, right? Um, and then he goes on to say, in any case, it was kind of you to share in my distress. Now, if we just look at this thank you note, just like if we just look at our covenant and kind of take it at face value, we miss an awful lot. Because you see, this is not just a thank you note. This is part of a letter that Paul has written to a church that he is very connected to. He established this church. He has a strong relationship with this church. And he is writing this letter with the intent that this letter will be read as a part of worship. That, that, and so it's got all the elements of worship within it, including a very odd thank you. But it's really not as odd of a thank you as it seems to be on the surface. So I wanna, I wanna kinda skip back a little bit and look at the opening because it's important for us to recognize Paul's relationship with this community and the covenant that they have together. As we look at our covenant um, and how we live into that, whether, and I'm not talking, again, I'm not talking about members, uh, just who we are as we gather together and be the people of God through First Methodist Church. So he starts this letter. I 
thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. This is what they hold in common. The gospel is at the core of who they are. Living out the gospel, sharing the gospel, embracing the gospel, sharing, is, it, this is just the core of who they are. And he goes on a little bit later, you know, he's, he's in jail, go figure, Paul's always in jail. Uh, but he goes on to say, only live, your, you know, I, I, I'm convinced of this. I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy and faith so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus. Do, do you see how important it is not only for Paul, but for this community to be Christ-centered? Everything they do is an expression of their relationship with Christ and their understanding of who they are called to be. And so uh, he goes on to say, you know, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come to see you or I'm not there and hear about you, I know that you are standing firm in one spirit. This is a key to understanding the point of this letter and the point of that really terrible thank you note that he writes at the end. Because now you begin to see that he's uncomfortable with them having some idea that he, he personally needs what they're offering or that he is personally not able to be fully who he is without their help. Because one of the things we know about Paul is he is utterly and completely dependent upon God. His absolute trust is in God to make provision for him. And so when he receives this other gift, because he's received many gifts from the people at Philippi, when he receives this gift, he wants to say thank you, but he wants them to understand that their gift is not about him and his situation, but this gift is about their participation in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a slightly different tilting of the framework way of understanding what he's trying to do. Let me see if I can explain it a little bit. I, I can stand up here before you and thank you for all the ways that you have given to this church, and I do. But understand that we're going to do what we do based on what we have to work with, right? We're not going to complain about it. We're content with what we have, and we will do what we can with what we have. We will do what we can with the volunteers that show up, with the gifts that you offer into service and ministry, with the money that you give. Yes, we're gonna, there's a little money involved in that. We will do what we're able to do with the resources that we have. And we will be content to be able to do those things. But Paul also notes that there are times when we can do more. And so he wants to be clear with this congregation that their giving is not about his needs. Your giving is not about my needs or the staff needs. Their giving is about their commitment to Christ and their willingness to share in whatever it takes to share that good news, to be in ministry with the communities that they're involved in to, to help out the people that God has placed before them. When we talk about giving our gifts as part of our covenant together, we're not talking about, well, I just wanna make sure they can keep the lights on. You know, I mean, we had a mo, I shouldn't even say this, we had a moment last week where the lights weren't on. You know, guess what, we still worshiped, right? Um, what Paul is trying to help us understand is it is not about perceiving the need. It is about recognizing that within ourselves we are called to offer back, to give all that we are, all that we can in pursuit of the cause of Christ. I mean, at our core, that's who we are too. Uh, and yet, I think we, we sometimes get a little hesitant, especially when we talk about money, because you know, you're not really supposed to talk about money. I have no idea why you're not supposed to talk about money, but you're not supposed to talk about money. Uh, the reality is it takes both money and people and ideas, and uh, it takes all of us working together 
to be able to accomplish the, the many things that God has called us to do. This isn't the only place that Paul talks about gifts. Uh, if we go back over to 2 Corinthians, where he's in, I don't know, this, we call it 2 Corinthians. There's some lost letters, so we don't know which number this one really is. Um, but in this one, he is talking about the collection for the Christians in Jerusalem, for the needs that have been lifted up there. And it's not just about their need. It is about being the people that God has called them to be. And he goes on to say this, the point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. And God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. Do you hear what we're invited to be a part of? Do you hear that we are invited to embrace this understanding that we have all we need personally, individually, collectively? We live in abundance. We often try to call it scarcity. But the truth is, you and I live in abundance. We have way more than we need. Paul even talks about this in that odd thank you note when he says, I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And then he goes on to talk about, I wasn't asking for the gift for me. I was asking for the gift because when you give the gift, when you participate in what God is doing, what Christ is doing, what Christ has called us to do together, you will have more than you've ever imagined. Now, I don't mean that in a prosperity, you know, put in $5, take out 10 kind of thing. What I mean is when you give openly, abundantly, cheerfully, willingly, not under compulsion, to the work that God is doing, when you are free to keep your hands open to share so that you're not clinging really tightly to everything you have, you have no idea how God will bless you. You already have more. What would it look like if you gave more? And I'm not just talking about your money. You have, we have so many gifts. Look around this congregation. Look around at the people seated here. Can, can you even begin to imagine the giftedness that we have in this space? The ideas that you have? The talents that you bring to bear? We already see it in so many ways, and yet we've barely tapped into it. Friends, that was a really lousy thank you note that I just said to you about all the ways that you participate in the life of this church. But here's what I want you to understand. This church doesn't need. You and I need. You and I need to do everything we can, extravagantly, generously, abundantly, to live fully into the calling that God has placed upon us. We're here in this place at this time for a reason. Do not withhold. Let's go all in and see how God will use who we are to bring forth what God desires for this community. Can you begin to imagine it? And yet I know we can do all the things that God has for us because it is indeed God who gives us the strength. Thanks be to God. Amen.